All right, welcome back. So this is our second video in this series of factor returns or factor models. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how we use the CAPM in the real world. Uh, so in our last video, I basically give you a, a quick intro to the CAPM. Uh, in this video, we're actually gonna use the CAPM. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll start off talking about the practical ac applications of the CAPM. There's a lot of them. And then we'll discuss and we'll talk about uh, how you actually predict alpha and then we'll actually calculate alpha and beta in the real world using real world data. Okay, so here we have the CAPM. Uh, so in the last video, I talked about the model form of the CAPM. That was the form of the CAPM that you've seen in at least two classes so far. Uh, certainly your intro finance class and then also your uh, investments class. Uh, this might be the first time you're seeing the regression form of the CAPM. If you didn't have me for investments. Uh, now, this is the form of the CAPM that we use to calculate our beta. And we'll also use it to calculate something that I haven't introduced yet called our alpha. Uh, the regression form of the CAPM is the form that we use in the real world when we're not trying to predict returns. Essentially, what we do is we use this form of the CAPM to run a simple linear regression and calculate our in this case, it'd be our uh, intercept and our slope. Now, let's go through this thing. R sub i is the return on stock i. That's our actual return on stock i. Minus the risk-free rate, R sub f. That's usually our yield on a T-bill or a T-note or a T-bond or you know whatever asset we consider to be risk-free. Next, we have alpha. And alpha, this is our, our intercept. There's a lot of things I could say about it, but uh, this is going to indicate whether or not our stock or our portfolio outperform the market. If we have a positive alpha, that indicates outperformance. If we have a negative alpha, it indicates underperformance. If we have a zero alpha, that indicates that the CAPM perfectly predicted this stock's returns, which is very, very rare. Uh, next, we have the beta. That's just our measure of market risk for stock I or this stock or portfolio or whatever we're analyzing. Uh, next, we have the market risk premium. So the actual return on the market, usually proxied by the S&P 500 return minus the risk-free rate. And then lastly, we have the error term, E sub I comma T. This is you might not have seen this before. What I'll tell you is that this is the thing that makes this entire equation balance. Uh, remember, like I said, we use this equation uh, along with simple linear regression. So we're gonna use a bunch of real world data. So we'll have, oh, in, in our example, we'll have 60 different observations here. Our alpha will be the same for all of them. Our beta will be the same for all of them, but our, our excess return on the stock and then our market risk premium, uh, those are gonna be different for all 60 of the observations. The error term is the value that balances the left and the right-hand side of this equation. So you'll see that. All right, uh, one final point I always like to, you know, this is a very easy testable question. If the CAPM was true and perfectly predicted uh, stock returns, what should we expect of our alpha in the estimation here? Well, if the CAPM perfectly predicted stock returns, alpha would be zero because you know we wouldn't be underperforming and we wouldn't be outperforming. Okay, so let's get a better sense of what alpha actually is. So I have here just our SML from our last video. And so each of these dots on the security market line, this red line indicates an expected return for a given level of market risk or beta. Now. The yellow and green dots here, these indicate actual returns. So, or sometimes we call these realized returns. Now, this dot right here indicates that this asset that has a beta of, let's say, 0.2, had during the year a an, expect, an actual return of, we'll say, 10.05%. Its expected return was about 5%. So what you can see here is that this stock, we'll, we'll say it's a stock, uh, outperformed what it was expected to offer by, well, in this case, 5.05%. That's its alpha. Alpha tells us by how much did this stock outperform what it was expected to offer based on the CAPM's prediction model. 
So alpha, I mean, that's really all it is. It tells us, did we outperform or underperform based on the cap M? Okay, so let's work on another CFA question. So uh, last year, a portfolio manager earned a return of 10%. The portfolio beta was 5% or 0.5. Uh, for the same period, the market return was 7%. The average risk-free rate was 7% or 4%. Jensen's alpha for this portfolio was closest to what? Now, I haven't actually introduced Jensen's alpha. Uh, when we talk about alpha, that's typically... You know, that can be an alpha on a stock or a portfolio. General, generally, when we talk about portfolio alphas, we use the term, the term Jensen's alpha. So if you ever hear the term Jensen's alpha, just recognize that that is the alpha on a portfolio, like a, a mutual fund or something. So let's pull this data into Excel and calculate this. Okay, so here we go. We have all the data we need, obviously, but let's identify our inputs. So the portfolio returned or had a return of 10%. That's R sub I. And I'll use decimals for this. I'll shrink this up. Next, we know the return on the market. That was, that's R sub M. And that is 7%. We also know the beta, I'll just use B because I don't want to dig up the beta symbol, uh, that is 0.5, and we know our risk-free rate is 4%, so in this case it is R sub F, and that is 0.04, awesome. Okay, so what is Jensen's alpha? Well, it might help if I, you know, so you can see what we're doing here, I'll, I'll put the equation over here. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so all we really need to do is plug and chug and calculate alpha. Now, a couple things here. Our error term, this is something that we only really use in regression. So our expected error term is always going to be zero because we generally like to assume that this model is perfect. There are no errors. It perfectly predicts. Uh, so error term is going to be equal to zero. Our alpha is, I'll just put going to be equal to uh, just our return on stock I minus the risk-free rate, so 0 0.10 minus 0 0.04, uh, and then we take everything else on the right-hand side over, so we're going to take the beta and times the market risk premium over to this other side, so subtract our beta of 0.5 times our market risk premium, so 0.07 minus 0.04 and I'm getting an alpha of 0.05 well if I that that's rounded so if I zoom this out and put it in percentage terms we get an alpha of 4.5 percent so the correct answer here is going to be B all right now it's time to talk about how we use the regression form of the cap M to actually calculate alpha and beta you know in uh, properly. So uh, hopefully you remember something about regression from your statistics class. Uh, just to refresh your memory, uh, with simple linear regression, what we do is we have one dependent variable. So one variable on the left-hand side, uh, we'll call this our y variable. And so what we'll do is we'll take this risk premium. Uh, so that'll just be the return on the stock I minus the risk-free rate. This entire thing will be our y variable. And then we need at least one independent variable. For simple linear regression, that means we have one uh, independent variable, one x variable. So our x variable in this case is going to be the market risk premium, just the return on the market minus the risk-free rate. So we're going to, as we say, regress our y variable on our x variable. And we're going to find the alpha and beta that when plugged in, minimize the sum of our squared errors. And what I mean by that is we're going to use 60 months worth of data. And for every single observation, there's going to be an error term. Basically, this, this formula, this equation isn't going to fit perfectly. If we were to square those error terms and then sum them up, uh, the alpha and beta we're going to get 
are going to minimize the sum of those squared errors. The computer is just going to run through a bunch of possibilities and pick the best alpha and beta that give us essentially the smallest error terms for every, uh, for, for the entirety of the data set. Okay, so let's use simple linear regression to estimate our, our alpha and our beta. And I'll walk through, you know, this entirety, this entire thing from start to finish. So uh, I've got this tab in our Excel spreadsheet for this section called CAPM example. Uh, let's go to it. Let's regress our stock returns or our portfolio returns on our market risk premium. Okay, so we're over here in Excel. And what we're going to do is we're going to run our CAPM regression. Now I have more than enough data to run this re regression. Uh, what we'll do is we'll use the entirety of this data for our next several examples. Uh, so let me just walk through what we have here. Uh, we have monthly return data going back to 1963. So uh, July of 1963. And uh, I should probably talk about this stuff. Uh, a lot of this data, basically all of these columns are pulled from a website that you will be very familiar with if you end up working in investments. Uh, Ken French, who's a big name academic, uh, he's one of the two members of the Fama and French team. Uh, basically, he puts out data on various risk factors. So this risk factor is our market risk premium. This is the, the big X variable in the CAPM. These other factors are the other four factors in our five factor model, the size factor, value factor, and then profitability factor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Risk-free rate, that's right here. And so if we wanna determine the alpha and beta of a security, we just need to pull data on that security. So that's what I've done in these two columns. I've selected two securities. First, we have the Pro Funds Semiconductor Ultra Sector Investment Fund. We'll call this SMPIX, you know, after its ticker symbol. Uh, VTWO, that's our Vanguard Russell 2000 Index ETF. And I should point out, we don't have complete data back to 1963 for these mostly because I think the VTWO was created in 2010 and the SMPIX uh, only goes back to 2000. I think that was probably the year of inception. Now, uh, to run a simple linear regression, what we need to do is first calculate the excess return on our fund. In this case, we're going to take our SMPIX return for that month, subtract from that the risk-free rate, and now we have our Y variable. And we're going to need observations, as, as many observations as we can get. So I'll copy this all the way down. And I'll do the same for our VTWO because we can build a portfolio of these two securities. Uh, but yeah, VTWO return minus risk-free rate. Copy this down. And now we have our excess returns. Now, before we get started with the regression, I probably should go down here. Uh, notice here that we don't have complete information. At some point, we're, we're taking a blank minus the risk-free rate. So I need to clear out this data. And then also the SMPIX, like I mentioned, at some point we, we run out of data. So I need to clear out everything below that point. But what we have now is our excess returns. We are finally able to run our simple linear regression. So let's do that. First things first, we go up to the data tab and we click on data analysis. Now, if you don't see the data analysis tool pack here, you need to add it. And to add it, what we do is we go over to file, down to options, add-ins, go down to Excel add-ins and click go. And I always just check everything here, uh, analysis tool pack, analysis tool pack, VBA, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then once you've got that, you can go to the data ribbon and select data analysis. Uh, scroll down to regression, click OK. And now we can highlight our data. So uh, our Y variable, like I said, is going to be our excess return on our asset. And here we need to make a choice. We have monthly data and usually we've got this trade-off. We want 
the most current data possible, but we also want enough data to accurately estimate the beta and alpha. So my recommendation is, you know, if we have monthly data, we typically want five years worth of monthly data. So I'm going to use uh, five years of monthly data. So basically rows one through 61. So I've got 60 months plus the label. So notice here that uh, row one is just the label. I've included that uh, because I've got a label in the first row. I'm going to check labels. And then our X variable is just going to be the market risk premium, this uh, column I. So I'll highlight everything in column I down to row 61 because I want 60 observations plus the label. And now I'll tell the computer where I want the output. I'll put it over here, uh, make it simple, just right where everyone can see it. And then uh, just so you can understand what those error terms were when we were talking about the regression form of the CAPM, I'll click residuals. Error terms and residuals, they mean the same thing. Uh, but here's what we should have to run the regression. So I'll click OK. And now we have our regression output. Now, we have a lot of stuff here for our regression output. We don't need it all. So we'll talk about what is actually valid here. Uh, so yeah, uh, first things first, R squared. Uh, hopefully you remember from your statistics class, your R squared is the explanatory power of the model. So what this really says is that the market risk factor explains about 63% of the variation in our uh, funds return. So basically we've accounted for about 63% of the volatility of our return. Uh, it's pretty good actually. Uh, next, as we go down here, like I said, we have 60 months of ob observ observations. If we had daily data, we could have used just like a year's worth of daily data, but monthly data, we want about 60. Uh, next we go down to our, uh, intercept and, uh, uh, slope. So here is our most important data. The intercept, this is our alpha right here. And then we also have our beta. And that's going to be right here. So this regression calculated our alpha and beta. Our beta is 2.01, 2.02. .02. Uh, our intercept or alpha is 2%. Uh, since we have monthly data, this is a 2% alpha per month. Uh, I, I gotta be honest with you. That is enormous. What this says is that every month this fund outperformed what the cap M predicted by 2.339%. So annually it was outperforming over this five year period by about 24%. That is awesome. Uh, our beta indicates that we have a, a very, very cyclical asset and our P value indicates that, uh, the market risk premium does in fact predict the, uh, the semiconductor ETF, the SMPIX, uh, returns or excess returns. So, uh, T stat is very high. P value is very low. Basically this indicates that, uh, we do have, uh, statistically significant prediction ability. Uh, T stat is greater than 1.96. So we uh, see significance well beyond the 5% level. Okay. So that's that. Now, uh, I did also pull the VTWO. And so I think we probably should run a regression using that. So we'll go back to the data tab, uh, data analysis, click regression. And this time I'll just change my input and I'll use 60 months of observations for VTWO. And I'll change the output range so it's over here. Click OK. Bam. Okay, so again, we have our alpha. And we have our beta. Those are right here. So the Russell 2000 has a beta pretty close to one, which I would expect. It's a market ETF. Uh, it has a slightly negative alpha, so 58 bips, 58 basis points every month. So it's underperforming uh, what we would expect or what the, you know, we would expect for its level of beta, uh, which is not ideal, but hey, whatever. 
Uh, now, now that we have these two securities, if we have some portfolio weights for these, we can actually calculate a portfolio alpha and portfolio beta. So let's say we put 75% uh, of our portfolio in SMPIX and 25% in VTWO. We can actually calculate our portfolio alpha, which is the 75% times our alpha of SMPIX plus our weight of VTWO times the alpha of VTWO. And there we go. Our portfolio alpha, if we have these weights, is still pretty high. I mean, it's, it's above zero, so that's good. You know, anything above zero for an alpha is good. We just want the highest value above zero. Our beta, same thing. We calculate a weighted average beta, so it's just our weight times beta plus weight times beta. There we go. So our beta is pretty high, uh, and then our alpha is also high. So uh, that is regression and portfolio estimates of alpha and beta. Okay, so what should you be able to do now? Well, you should know how we calculate the beta and the alpha of a stock. Uh, I will expect you to be able to use regression uh, by the time we get to an exam. Uh, I also expect you to know the basic assumptions that the CAPM is based on. I talked about three of them. Even though you know they really don't hold up that well in the real world, is it is very important to know those assumptions. Uh, also, you should know the motivation behind the CAPM and what it implies. Basically, the more market risk that a firm has, uh, the higher or the higher the expected return on that firm's equity. And then you should know the testable implications of the CAPM. So, what should alpha be if the CAPM was true? We talked about this. Basically, it should be zero. You know, it perfectly predicts uh, stock returns. So, oh, alpha equals zero. Okay, so let's summarize. This is the formula that we talked about in this section. Uh, it's the regression form of the CAPM, and the CAPM says that there is a single risk factor, the market risk premium, that predicts excess stock returns. Uh, in practice, we base our, uh, we calculate our alpha and beta using historical data. Uh, the alpha indicates the amount of outperformance or underperformance. And portfolio alphas and betas are just weighted averages of the security alpha and betas. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.